So we are going to start with our first topic. And uh, the first topic is the nature and purpose of uh, management accounting. The nature and purpose of management accounting. Nature and purpose of, we can call it advanced management accounting. Management account. The nature and purpose of advanced management account. Now, in our discussion, the very first thing that we need to begin with is the definition of management accounting. And when we talk about management accounting, we are talking of a process that entails sourcing, the analysis, the communication, and uh, use of decision relevant financial and financial information to generate and preserve value for the organization. So there are key words that have been mentioned there. One is that management accounting is about sourcing. Now to source means to gather. You go out there and collect information. Then once you have sourced, you analyze this information. You analyze this information, you put it in a very good way, in a format that can be understood by anyone who would want to use it. And then you communicate or you present this information. You communicate, that is the communication of the information. Uh, and this communication is done to anyone who is interested. And the other thing that we have said is that this information will be used for decision making. This information will be used for decision making. And uh, it therefore requires that when you are communicating this information, and even when you are gathering this information, you must gather information that is relevant. You must gather information that is important to the user of your information. Now, the other thing that comes on board is that this information that you are going to gather, it is both financial and non-financial. It is both financial and non-financial. Now, when we talk about the financial, we are talking of data that you can be able to quantify data that you can be able to quantify. For example, you can say sales for last year, we made 3 million. The number of customers in the last one month, they were 20. So it is something that you can quantify. That is what we call the financial. And much of this financial information, we source it from the so-called financial statements, which we know so well, the income statement, uh, the statement of financial position and such other financial statements. But on top of that, we also require the non-financials. Non-financials, they are what we would call quality, the qualitative uh, information, information that you cannot be able to quantify. For example, you can say that we have been having some good customers. Now, the issue of a customer being good you cannot be able to quantify. You can say that we are in a very convenient location. Now, the convenience of our location cannot be quantified. You can also say that the company has very good or has very understanding managers. So you cannot be able to quantify the understanding of the managers. So that is about the information that we are gathering. Now, this information, it is meant, number one, to help make decisions in an organization. And in making this decision, the end goal is that we can be able to generate value. We can be able to generate value. Like what I am doing here and now with you is that I source this information. 
I have analyzed it in the handout that I've given you. I am now communicating it to you because you require to make some decisions. And this information that I'm communicating to you is relevant. It is relevant as in it is the syllabus content of what will be in your exam. And this information again uh, is qualitative, it is well done. We can also quantify, or well, maybe we say I've given you a handout of five pages or 10 pages or whatever. And the objective is that you can be able to generate value. After listening to me throughout this course, your value will go a little bit higher. You will now have a paper and you'll be saying to have qualified as far as advanced management accounting is concerned. And consequently, someone who would not have considered you for a position that requires advanced management accounting will now consider you for that. And if right now you are earning 10 shillings and you are, concerned, you are considered for this, you start earning 12 shillings, then the difference of two shillings is, uh, uh, is value that we have generated from this course. So the information is supposed to generate value. And on top of generating value, we must also ensure that we are preserving value. You will agree with me that most of us, they are very good in generating value, but we are very poor when it comes to preservation of value. Look at even things such as relationships. There are people who are very good in making friends, making new friends, but they don't keep friends. Every month, they have a new friend. Every year, they have a new friend. You ask them what about the friend they had five years ago. They can't even remember because they are not able to preserve. The same thing happens even in businesses, especially when the vision bear uh, passes on. And this is very common with Africans. You will find that when the vision bearer passes on, that business also dies with that person. That's what we say in our beat. And it is not the business that dies. It is because the managers who are supposed to be in charge of this business, they generated value, but they were not good in ensuring that there is preservation, in ensuring that there is what we, we popularly refer to as succession uh, chart of the organization. And the same happens even in companies. You find that this minister was there or this, uh, this manager was there, and after they have gone, you find some projects are story. Look at even what is going to happen in the government. Now that we have a new government in place, being uh, set in place, we are likely to see some changes. If those places, we do not have very good preservation mechanisms. So by all that, I'm simply defining the meaning of management accounting. And we are saying it is the aspect of sourcing, analyzing, communicating information uh, which is relevant and that information must be financial and non-financial so that the user can make a decision and the decision is about generation of value and preservation of value. Now in very simple words, we define management accounting as the provision of information. That is the simplest uh, uh, definition. It is the provision of information. It is the provision of information uh, required for managerial decision making. Uh, provision of information required for effective, required for effective execution of managerial functions, for effective execution of managerial functions of managerial functions. That is what we call, or how we can define uh, management accounting in a very, very simple way. It is the provision of information. Now, this information, rather before that, eh, when we talk about these managerial functions, from your other studies, you know managerial functions include things such as planning, they include things such as staffing, they include uh, what we call coordination, they include what we call directing, they include budgeting, and so on. So these are functions that are done by managers. So for managers to effectively execute that, they require information. And that information must be provided. It's the same concept. 
Like right now, we have uh, some task forces being formed by the presidency to gather information, like the most recent is the CBC one. That task force is going to provide information. It's going out throughout the country to gather, to source the relevant information so that they can now provide to the manager. And the manager is the president or the presidency. So that the presidency or the president can effectively execute their functions. And that is the same thing that happens in an organization. Now, this information that we provide, it should have some characteristics. Number one, the information must be timely. When you are communicating, you must communicate on time. You must not communicate too early. You must also not communicate when it is late. So information that you communicate must be timely. Number two, the information must be economical. By economical, we mean that information must not be very expensive. The cost of getting the information must be lower or equal to the benefits or the value that will be generated by that information. The other thing is that this information that you provide should be accurate. You should not provide information that is full of errors. Like now, the handout and the notes that I'm giving you, if they are full of errors, if I keep on telling you cancel that, toa here or get a here, now that is not right. It becomes a nuisance to the user. It defeats the original goal of that communication. Uh, this information, again, as we have said here, it must be relevant and so on. So that is basically how we can uh, be able to define management accounting. Now, from there, let's look at types of managerial accounting reports. Types of managerial accounting reports. Types of managerial accounting reports. Now, as you can see in our notes there, we have given various types of reports. And the first one is the budget report. Now, a budget, as we will realize later on when we come to that topic, it is simply a statement that shows the expected and the available incomes vis-a-vis -vis the expected and the available expenses, how they will be, uh, they, they, they will be matched. It shows the incomes that we have and how those incomes will be used. It shows the incomes and the expenses. That is the simple definition of the budget. The other report that you get is what we call the accounts receivables. Now, the accounts receivables uh, is not very prominent in management accounting. It's more of financial reporting. But nonetheless, we still prepare uh, accounts receivables, uh, with, uh, what pertains to the management accounting. The other thing is what we call the job uh, cost, the job cost reports. Now, that will be our main state. It is the main report that we will keep on preparing. As we go through the cost, management will be more about the cost. So we will keep on uh, analyzing or preparing those managerial reports. The other thing is what we call inventory uh, reports. And these inventory reports, they are reports that we will keep on uh, uh, talking about. Actually, we have a topic called inventory controls. So those are the four types of, event, of of managerial reports that are required to be prepared. Now, from there, we need to discuss the role of management accountants. The role of management accountants. The role of management accountants. If you are employed as a management accountant, what is it that we expect you to be doing? Number one, we expect what we call stewardship accounting. Stewardship accounting. Now, when we talk about stewardship accounting, it comes from the word or the narrative of a servant and a master. And the servant is the, the, the steward. And the steward is supposed to do their duties with a lot of honesty, with a lot of commitment, with a lot of faithfulness. So when you are employed as a management accountant, you are deemed to be a servant of your employer. And we expect you to execute your duties with a lot of faithfulness, 
with a lot of honesty, with a lot of gentleness, and so on. That is what we call stewardship. Now, stewardship is where you are serving a person, not necessarily looking at what you will get, but more so being preoccupied with how your service will benefit the other person. So that is what we call stewardship accounting. The other thing that we require the manager or the accounting manager to do, the management accounting to do, is planning. Now, from your leadership and management or other courses, you know that planning is the aspect of laying down the intended courses of action. It is about developing the models. It is about forecasting. Now, this course of management accounting, it is full of uh, forecasts. We will have several topics that we'll be talking about forecast, about planning, and that will be also a mainstay in the office as you work as a management accountant. The other thing is that you must be able to develop what we call management systems. Now, in as much as we are not experts in computer issues, the little knowledge that we have about management information systems, we should bring it on board where we work so that our bosses can be able to track the operations of the organization. So as a management accountant, it is your responsibility to design and to ensure that those simple systems are working to the advantage of your employer. The other role that you're supposed to take is uh, what we call participation in management process. Now, participation in management process uh, says or, is, or comes in because in as much as we are saying you are a management accountant, that does not make you a manager. Actually, it simply means you are an accountant who should be providing a lot of information to the manager. That is how we can look at it. You are an accountant who should be providing a lot of information to the manager. That's one of the reasons why it's called management account. Now, if that is so, it then means that a management accountant is not a manager per se. So there is a manager there. There is a board. There is your boss. But in the process of your boss executing their managerial functions, they may invite you to assist. So when you are invited to present reports, then you should be able to do that in a very good way. I sit in some boards of companies, and at times we call the accountant to come and give us some information. So when you are in that board, you are participating in the managerial functions. The other thing that you need to do is the issue of controlling of costs. This is one of the major roles of a management accountant. Companies nowadays are employing management accountants to advise them on how they can minimize costs. How can we go about minimizing costs? How can we do away with this cost so that our profits can increase? Especially nowadays, when uh, customers are constrained economically and you may not be able to increase prices. So how do you survive in making uh, that the company is reducing the cost making profits that will ensure that it is sustainable. So it's the role of the management accountant to advise the boss in regard to that. The other thing is decision making. So as a management accountant, you are called upon to ensure that there is the aspect of decision making. We will be looking at decision making in a while, so let me not overdwell in that. Let, let me not preempt. Now, what are the advantages of management account? If your company is doing management accounting, what are the advantages that you can enjoy? Number one, all the advantages that you enjoy is that there is reduced costs. We are able to reduce costs. Remember, we have said one of the functions here is to advise on how costs can be controlled. So if you successfully do that, then we are going to experience a reduction in cost, obviously, uh, without altering the value that we are rendering to our customers, and that will be a very, very good uh, uh, step as far as the company is concerned. Another advantage is that there is the improvement of the cash flows. There is improvement of cash flows. Now, cash flows has to do with 
how much money is coming in, how much money uh, is going out. And it has more to do with when we are required to make cash payments or when we are required to settle some obligations, do we have that money? Uh, are we experiencing shortages or are we holding too much money? Now, that aspect can be sorted by what we call uh, preparation of budget. If there is somewhere we say one of the wrong, but one of the reports of management accountant is to, uh, is to prepare budgets. So if you have done some very nice budgets, then it becomes very easy uh, for you to manage the cash flows so well. Number three is that we have what we call enhanced business decisions. So in other words, we are able to make what we call sound decisions. We are able to make the right decisions and our company does not suffer uh, because of the wrong decisions. Number four advantage that we get is that there is increased financial returns. Now, if you are following the discussion theory, then you notice that if we are able to uh, successfully do all what I have said, then your company is going to enjoy a lot of returns. Your company is going to enjoy a lot of returns. Now from there, let's look at characteristics of management account. Characteristics of uh, management account. The characters of management account. The characters of management account. And uh, in this one, number one, it is a technique that is selective in nature. Now, as a manager, you receive so many, in, uh, so many items, so much information. Actually, if you look at any office of a manager, you will find very many people queuing to get into that office. And most of these people, they have a lot of irrelevant information. They have a lot of even untrue information. So as a manager, if you keep on reacting on every information that comes your way, you will get it very long all the way or all the time. So you must have the ability to be selective, to know what do I respond to, what do I ignore, what do I consult further. So the element of being selective is very, very important and is a character, is a major feature you find with successful managers. Number two, is that it only provides data. So management only provides data. It does not help you make the decision. Remember, I have said here that management accounting is about provision of information. Then you will decide on the decision to make. It is just like in this class, I have given you the notes. It is now for you to decide whether you will read or you will not read. I cannot be able to read for you. I cannot be able to make a decision for you. So mine, as your manager in this class, is just to present data to you. Then now you, as the manager, as the user of this information, you decide on what you want to do with the information. Actually, that's why nowadays, in our artwork, what we do with this information is none of my business. Uh, because it is upon you now, as the receiver of the information, to decide on whether you shall use it or not. The other thing is, uh, it is concerned with the future. Now, this is a very, very important characteristic of any manager. Any person who wants to call themselves a manager or a leader, they must be focused on the future. If you find someone who is talking about the present or the past, that person can only be a follower. They can never be leaders. So we must get people who are progressive, who are able to see far, who are able to tell us their dreams, who are able to convince us that this thing can work, although they have not been there because none of us have been to the future, but we must be able to think uh, futuristic. That's the character of a good manager. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it is a step or is about the analysis of different variables. Now, as a manager, you don't just consider one item. You don't just consider one item. You consider so many things. Actually, right now, uh, for you, I can maybe even ask you, what are some of the factors that you consider 
for you to join destiny. Let me hear from you. Some of the factors I consider. Aha, uh Ogata -huh. Horin, Jakuskia Mizuri. Because I want to pass the exam so that okay. I can get knowledge. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you can't hear me? No, now I can hear you. Yes, now. Uh -huh. I'm saying because yes. I want to pass my exams, that's why I'm, I'm joined so that I can get that knowledge. Okay. Just a minute, I boost my, 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 my speaker. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Now, can you speak? I get to know whether I can hear you now. Uh, wait, mine has disconnected. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you well. But my my, my earphones have disconnected. You are? Let me connect my earphones. They had dis disconnected. Yeah, now I can hear you. Good. So now I will ask, yeah. uh, why uh, did you decide to join Destiny? Uh, because one, you offer online classes. Mm -hmm. Two, I want to get uh, to get knowledge so that I can pass my exams. You consider our school fees? Uh, yeah, it is, it is affordable. It's affordable, good. Now, yeah. this, uh -huh. anything else? That's all. Good. So that is what we were saying, or I was saying, that when you are doing management, because even you are joining this class, it is about managing yourself, or managing your academics, or managing your, your career, you consider more than one factor. And you are saying you have already considered the issue of the online classes, you have considered that you require the knowledge, you have considered that you require the fee, you have even considered even the time that the lesson is offered, is a fee you are saying you are on and you are available at that time, and so on and so on. So as a manager, you consider more than one factor. Good, so are we okay at that point? Yeah, we are good. Now, from there, we look at what we call the scope of management account. The scope of management account. Now, when we talk about the scope, it is uh, it has to do with what is it that the good manager should know and should apply in their practice. And in this case, you realize that 
there are different schools of thought that come into play. First of all, there is the school that says that a manager is born. And another school says that a manager is made. So you don't have to be born a manager, we make you. There is another school that says that a man a management is science. It is based on some uh, steps that you can be able to follow, that can be defined. And some other school says that management is an art. That means you do not have predetermined steps. You can do things in your own way. Now, all these schools, they offer contradicting or conflicting information. And uh, one thing that comes out is that for you to be a good manager, you must know everything. That is actually what we say, that a manager should know everything. However, practically, it is not possible for any human being to know everything. It is only God who knows everything. Now, in that case, then, it follows that the manager should know some things, not all the things, but most of the things. Now, developers of these careers and so on, they have sat down and defined, if someone is to be called a management accountant in Kenya, this is what they should know. If someone is to be called a man an accountant in Kenya, this is what they should know. And what they should know is what now we see as the syllabus, as the content, the subjects that you need to be taught. So when you talk about the, the, the scope, we are looking on at which subjects should you know. And by very simple way, I want to summarize that and say, all what you have covered in your journey of CPA is relevant, is part of the scope. You need to know something like economics so that you can understand how the markets work, how do we set prices. You need to know something like law so that you know how can I form a company? Uh, how do we sign contracts? What do we mean by the law of thought? How, what do you mean by the sale of goods act? You need to do something like QA so that you can be able to develop models. Remember we are just saying here that management accounting involves planning. So you need to do QA, a lot of statistics to come up with models that will help you. You need to do taxation so that you can know how do we charge taxes, when do we pay taxes, and so on and so on. You need to do IT so that you know how can I take advantage of, uh, uh, of the, the information technology developments that are there. So as you can see in the notes, we have listed a bit of those things. You can be able to look at them. Now from there, we look at what we call limitations of management accounting or limitations of management in general. What are the challenges that you will find any time you want to practice management accounting? Number one, is that it is based on financial and cost records. And these records may not be accurate. Remember, I'm saying management is about the provision of information. Now, where did we source this information? Where we sourced it, was it accurate? And remember, they say garbage is in, garbage is out. So if your source was wrong, then your result will also be wrong. And the actions that you take will be wrong. So we have that challenge because we are not the ones who prepared that information. Maybe the books of original entry, we are not the ones who did them. So we cannot guarantee or we are not able to deal with the accuracy. We already trust that those guys did a good job. But quite often, or in some cases, we find that there are errors. The other challenge that you come across is that management is affected highly by personal biases. Now, personal biases, they have to do with uh, the style of the leader. And right now, we have had a change in the presidency. Uhuru has exited, Ruto has come in. You, we have already witnessed a change of style because every leader has their own bias. They have their own style. Even in companies, this MD goes, another one comes in, and you find things are changing. So management cannot be said that it is so defined in a particular way. It depends on who is the manager. And that becomes a challenge. That becomes a challenge when we, because the challenge is what I already have called the, the preservation, the issue of succession. 
because people have different biases. The other thing is that uh, there may be lack of understanding. There may be lack of understanding. Remember, in the scope here, we have said that the manager should know most of the things, if not all. But we also get managers who have who do not have the know-how of how things should be done. And we have seen these things, even in government, someone is appointed. For example, we have had cases, uh, even right now, the Minister of Health is not a medical doctor. Now, in as much as he's very good in policy, there are places he will go and get stuck because he's not a medical doctor. And even if again he was a medical doctor, he's only specialized in one area and the Ministry of Health captures so many things. In the Ministry of Education, at least there we had someone who is an educationist for many years uh, and so on. So you find that uh, the issue of understanding becoming a problem. The other thing is uh, it provides data only. So if we just get data and we don't help these managers make decisions, again, we may fail to get our original purpose because you could give someone very good information, a very good report, but they are not able to use it. It is, I think they say in Kiswahili, when you meet your are you aware of that? The that? Yeah. When you meet your father, you need a father of agency. What that means is that we have the, the, the timber, we have the trees, we have the, the, the what is required. But the expertise that is required to use those resources is not there. And even in general life, now I have a hand that says, hey, who you want to see upon a hee, a hee, a hee, come on, me, 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 Lakini yeye unaona hapo na all those opportunities lakini hazimsaidi. Have you seen such cases? Yes. Yeah, so they are there and uh, that becomes a challenge. That becomes a challenge. The other thing is that preference in intuitive uh, decision making. What we mean by intuitive, it is a situation where you perceive something in your mind, something that is abstract, something is not that is not making a lot of sense and you explain to people and they become convinced. A very recent case was the issue of the bottom-up with all political uh, due respect, uh, so that you don't take me from a political perspective. What I'm saying is that when the issue of the bottom-up was mentioned, there are many of us who would wonder, how can it be done? How do we take the resources down there? How do we now move from the trickle down to the bottom up. But someone had believed in it. He had been convinced about it and he talked about it. And where we are now, almost a, a big percentage of us are believing in that. That is called intuition. It is where you believe in something that people cannot be able to, or are not believing in it. And you convince them uh, to go about it. Just a minute. So we were saying that intuition is where you believe in something and you convince others to believe in it. The other problem with management is that there will always be resistance 
Yeah, there will always be resistance. Why there is resistance is because any good management must be futuristic. And if we have to go to the future, we must create a change. And generally, people do not like a change. They want status quo to remain. So when you come proposing changes, you can be sure you will face a lot of resistance. You will face a lot of resistance. But the beauty with it is that if you have powers, you are able to overcome that resistance. That is a major, major limitation. The other thing is that uh, it may require continuity and participation. As we said here, we require to preserve value. We require to ensure that there is continuity, there is preservation. But uh, unfortunately, not many people are able to allow others to participate. I've been to organizations where the manager does everything by himself. Even in family setups, you may find if it is the husband who is in charge, he does everything alone. If it is the wife who is in charge or the parents, someone does things alone without involving others. And when they are gone, then you find that it becomes very difficult. Yeah, and as I said earlier, we experience these things so, uh, so many times, especially in the, in, the, in the African family setups. You find museum and properties, but none of his family members is aware of where the documentations of those properties are, even the locations of those properties are. And at times it takes uh, the goodwill of the friends to come and tell the family that your father or your mother had properties here and here. And in the process, you find that some of those properties get destroyed, they get lost, they get stolen, simply because there was no continuity or there was no participation. The person did not bring the people on board. But also, it could be this person brought, tried to bring them on board, but they could not cope. They refused. We have had cases where parents have tried to introduce their kids to businesses. And those kids, they refuse or they come and mismanage. So that becomes a challenge of uh, management because we are not able all the time to ensure that there is successful mentorship or mentoring of those people who will take over uh, or after us. The other thing is that management is evolutionary in nature. What that means is that management keeps on changing. The way you are managing your life today is not the way you are managing your life last year, actually even yesterday. Yeah? Today you are now attending a management uh, accounting class. Jana, uh, before yesterday you are not attending the class. So there has to be a change in how you manage your life from today because management accounting has come in. So every day, every day in, every day out, there are new changes that are happening in your life that you require different approaches. Actually, in entrepreneurship, we normally say, if you manage your business today using the strategies that gave you success yesterday, that business will not see tomorrow. If you manage your business today using the strategies that gave you success yesterday, that business will not see tomorrow. Why? Yesterday is different from today. Today is different from tomorrow. And therefore, as a result of those differences, then the strategies must also be different if you want to maintain success of that organization. The other thing is that uh, there is use of a lot of unquantifiable factors. As I had mentioned earlier here, there is a lot of this information, and this is very, very important. Actually, as far as management accounting is concerned, we give a lot of importance to this than this. But unfortunately, how do we capture that? It becomes a major, major headache. So those are the issues to do with the uh, limitations. Are we okay up to that point? Uh, are we? Yes, we're okay. Okay, so let's now go to the issue of the code of ethics. The code of ethics. The code of ethics. Code of ethics of management account. Code of ethics of management account. Now, when we talk about the code of ethics, 
we are simply talking of what is expected of you in terms of your behavior, in terms of your conduct. And you will find that even where you are, in the many organizations, we have a booklet, we have a code of ethics, we have the terms and conditions that you must be able to follow even as you remain there. Now, for us, as management accountants, we have four codes of ethics. One of them is competence. One of them is competence. Now, when we talk about competence, we are talking about the skills. We are talking about the knowledge. Before you go calling yourself a management accountant, it is required that you should have the relevant skills, the relevant knowledge. Some of them include having gone through the CPA and being certified by CASLO, who is our examiner. Another one is that you should be recognized or you should be registered by ISPAC. Those are some of the skills that you require to have. And when we talk about these skills, it is also required after you have graduated, after you have left school, you must continually update yourself with what is happening. Because they say change is the only thing that does not change. Why CASNEP comes in, it is to ensure that you get the initial knowledge, the initial academic skills. That is the role of CASNEP. Then the role of ISPA is to ensure that you maintain that knowledge and you are updated with the changes that are happening. I remember in our days in school, we used to talk of trading profit and loss account. But nowadays, you people, you are talking of income statement. In our days, we used to talk of balance sheet. Nowadays, you are talking of statement of financial position. So anyone who was in my class and after we graduated has never checked what has happened, the changes that have happened, when you listen to them, they are still talking of trading profit and loss account. They are still talking of balance sheet, while people have already moved. So if you are to send that person to facilitate a class or to facilitate a seminar, there will be breakdown of communication because what you will be mentioning is not what is there. So ISPAC comes in to ensure that that does not happen. And how do they do it? It is by ensuring that you are registered and then they renew your license every year. And for the license to be renewed, you must have attended some seminars and acquired what they call the CPDs, the CPD, the Continuous Professional Development Points. And uh, these ones, you must acquire them for your license to be renewed. It is in those seminars, it is in those workshops that you are updated of any recent change that has happened since the last time you were in school and therefore you are updated. When we talk about uh, competence, we are also talking about performing your duties in regard to three things or in compliance with three things. One, it is about the rules by your employer. Like now when I'm here and I'm teaching you, I am employed by Destiny Technical Training Institute. There is what Destiny expects me to do and I should comply with that. Number two, as I teach you here, I am also under the, uh, the regulation of ISPAC, who manages our profession, the accounting. There is what ISPAC expects of me as a teacher, as a worker here. Then I'm also under the regulations of the government of Kenya. There is what the government of Kenya expects me to do as a teacher. Now, these expectations Ideally, we expect that they agree. We expect that what the government expects of me is what is part expect of me is what uh, employer expects of me. For example, the government of Kenya expects that as an accountant, you should be able to facilitate your company to pay taxes in full and in time. The same is expected of you by this part. But quite often, you may come to an employer and they tell you no. We are not going to pay the tax on time. We are not going to pay the full tax. We want you to use your knowledge and advise us on how we can avoid or even how we can evade tax. Now, when they say that, then there is a collision of what your employer is expecting of you, what ISPAC is expecting of you, and what the government of Kenya is expecting of you. Now, in such a case, 
in such a case, what you are advised to do is to obey whoever you think can punish you more severely. Whoever you think can punish you more severely. Uh, Wangoi, maybe you can tell me. Of these three, who do you think can punish you more severely? The employer. The employer. Yeah. Okay, it's a good response, but uh, the employer is the least. Because the maximum punishment your employer can give you is just to fire you. That firing is not welcome, it's not good because here and there it will cause inconveniences. But it's not all of us. You can work with many other employers. Most likely even the one you have right now is not the first one. Are you with the first employer now? No. You have had a change, Sibyl? Yes. Yeah. Uh, are you convinced this is the last one? No. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you're not, <laughs> with <government>. <laughs> <laughs> you're not working with government, chances are you're keeping or looking for greener pastures. It is only I want yeah. government when they get into government. That's a is that so? Yeah. So that tells you if your employer chases you away, you can always look for a job. And uh, sooner or later, we may not know when, but sooner or later you will get another job. If back, the maximum punishment is back and give you, they can make you to be fired from the job and they can deregister you. When they deregister you, that means you can never practice accountancy in the Republic of Kenya and even beyond. It means all the years you have been in school, all the years you have been in the field, getting a lot of experience as an accountant has been brought to nothing. And that can be a serious loss. You see, a person like me, I've been a teacher for many years, actually for 17 years. So you can be sure a big network of my life, they know me as a teacher. So anyone wanting to do something for me or wanting me to do something for them, they engage me on the basis of being a lecturer in accountancy. So if now I am prevented from doing that and I have to start again, now, for example, I start, uh, I go and maybe study engineering or I go and become a farmer. Very few people know me as a farmer. Very few people will know me as an engineer. So again, you can imagine starting those years. It is a big loss. When it comes to government, government will ensure that you are fired from where you are working. They will ensure that you are the start. By ISPA. They will jail you and they will confiscate all your assets. You know, Kitabo, it used to be that uh, when you are found on the wrong side, they will just put you in behind bars for like five years or ten years, then you are released. And some guys would argue, I would rather steal the 20 million and focus me a katana. Then after my katana, I put it to me my 20 million. Because even if I work for the five years, I cannot accumulate this money. Have you ever heard of that argument? Yeah. Yeah. But nowadays, government has taken the notch higher. They are not only arresting, they are also taking away what you had accumulated. We are seeing nowadays the account being frozen. We are seeing repossession of properties and so on. So you can imagine now this kind of punishment. So government is the one that can punish you more severely. Now for those of us who are religious like me, we also bring the issue of God. But now that is not part of our notes because this is not a religious class, it's a secular class. But it's also a fact that we are religious somehow. So if you are religious, then you know what your God tells you, how you should do what you do. And then you should know how he can punish you. And from there now you decide whether you can do it in the world, the employer. 
So those are the confines, the three confines, but I'm adding the fourth one uh, that should be uh, about competence. The other thing is that uh, you should give recommendations to your boss, recommendations that are accurate, recommendations that are timely, and recommendations that are very, very clear. Now, as a manager here, I have told you that it is your work to provide information to your manager so that they can execute the management functions effectively. I have also said that in as much as we are calling you a management accountant, you are not really a manager. So you are at the lower level. Now, at the lower level, you are able to interact with so many people compared with your boss there. And consequently, you come across a lot of information which your boss may not come across. So it is now for you to advise your boss. And you advise them on a timely basis. You advise them uh, accurately in a very clear way. Whether they take your advice or not, that is not your business. Your business is to ensure that you advise them. I want to take a case in point that maybe you could be aware. Uh, and again, I say that I hope you don't take me in a very political way. Uh, there is this uh, senator who is now the governor of Kurana, Kanata. And this guy, during the, 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 the issues of BPI, he wrote a letter to the president, the then president to rule, and he told him that on the ground, this document is not popular. And as a result, we saw him being removed from his position as uh, the majority leader in Senate. But what happened after the entire process? The document failed. So the recommendation that had been given by this senator uh, came out to be true. Now, this senator, in as much as he suffered the loss of his position, he did or he acted ethically because he advised. He advised. Now, it would have been very wrong if later on, after the fall of BBI, that is now when he's taking the letter to the president of Amir, Now, in that case, you, you need to be fired. You need to be punished even more severely. Actually, we normally say, when we are talking about this type of information, if you are not able to speak in good time, you should keep quiet. You should keep quiet uh, forever. Uh, you should keep quiet. So you must advise uh, your boss. The other thing about the competence is that you must recognize any limitation. You must recognize any limitation that you could be having that can prevent you from effectively executing your job. For example, we know for you to fully audit the accounts and file them with the registrar, you require to have the stamp from ISPAC. But there are many, many of us who do not have those stamps. In as much as we are CPA finalists, we are also registered with ISPAC at Japewa Hill. So a customer comes to you and they ask for your audit services. You should be able to tell them that I will do the paperwork, but after I'm through, I will go to someone else who has the stamp, pay him something, and they stamp for me or for us. So if this person agrees, then you have acted ethically. But it should not be a situation where you go present yourself as a fully fledged auditor. You have everything. And you tell this client, maybe you need to you can your audit. Then later on, the client comes to know that the stamp does not belong to your firm. It is unethical. You should disclose any limitation. Another example is you get a job. And when you get a job, again, as an auditor, the chief accountant is your spouse, or you have a very special relationship with the accountant in that company where you have been appointed auditor. You should disclose and tell the company that I'm grateful that you have given me this job, but please note that your chief accountant is my spouse. Your chief accountant is my parent. Your chief accountant is my child. Your chief accountant is my good friend. Your chief accountant is my enemy, because even an enemy is also a special relationship. Now, when you disclose this, if the client 
is ready for you to proceed with that, then that is ethical. But it should not have a situation where you can't pretend that you have no relationship with anyone who is in that company, then do your work, give your report, then later on, we come to realize that there was such a special relationship. Now that special relationship could have influenced the kind of report that you gave. If the relationship was good, then chances are you gave a good report. If the relationship was not good, chances are you gave a wrong report. So you must disclose, you must be able to tell people that I'm doing this, but this is my position. It is always very, very important. Otherwise, if you do not disclose it, you are likely to put a lot of people in the mess. You are likely also to suffer uh, when you don't disclose. So those are the four things about competence. The second ethical standard is about confidentiality. It's about confidentiality. Now, confidentiality has to do with uh, the aspect of keeping secrets. Now, as a management accountant, you are entrusted with a lot of information, the so-called classified information, which even your boss at times does not have it. You are the one who knows how much everyone is paid. You are the one who knows who owes what. You are the one who knows the financial state, uh, status of the company and so on. Now, this information is not information to go releasing or broadcasting to everyone. You need to keep a secret. You need to be confidential. Even when your employer here is doing something that is wrong, you are not supposed to talk about it. Not unless you are legally authorized or you want to be you, you, you want to be patriotic. Now the government of Kenya calls upon all of us to be patriotic. But on the other side, there is something that we say in matters ethic and matters confidentiality. You should always speak if you are ready to pay the ultimate price, death. If you find your employer does not pay taxes, don't be the whistleblower to KRI. Let KRI discover in their own way. If you find your employer is a man, is a thief, is a drug dealer, is a, is a human trafficker, it is not for you to become a whistleblower, not, a, not unless you are ready to pay the ultimate price. What we normally advise is that if you have to speak, then make sure you are well covered in terms of law, in terms of security. If you cannot cover yourself, or if the government cannot cover you, actually the government has done a good job. They have what they call the Witness Protection Fund, or the Witness Protection uh, Agency, something like that, which is meant for people to, to be protected when they miss a blow. But if you are not convinced that it will work, then it's advisable when you come across some of these things, you quietly resign and go home to your family. Otherwise, these people who do these criminal activities, they can easily eliminate you and life will go on as usual. It is only your immediate family that will be left crying and knowing that our so-and-so left. People will demonstrate. People will call press conferences before the burial. But after the burial, everyone goes back to their own duties and stations. It is your immediate family that is left to pray or to feel the pain. And we have many cases. I don't want to cite any. Uh, I don't want to cite any, but I know you have seen many. People have demonstrated, people have said manner, all manner of things, but after the burial, you are married in Asia. So you must be very careful as you disclose this. The other thing is uh, you must keep all the information confidential and inform all the relevant parties. What we mean by this is, you could be typing or you could be having a confidential document on your desk. And then someone enters into an office without your knowledge or without you quickly realizing that this confidential document is on the table. And by the time you come to realize, they already have read the content of that document. For example, 
it is a document from the boss, or you are typing on behalf of the boss, which says employee A will be fired on Friday. And today is Tuesday. But employee B has come and has come to, has seen that document on Tuesday. Now you are the accountant or the management accountant. You must tell this employee B that he document Umeona about employee A it is very confidential. It is only me and the boss who are aware, and now you. And if I hear about the document before Friday, I will know where we say man. So you warn them very, very strictly. And not only one, you also ensure that they comply. Tomorrow on Wednesday, tomorrow on Wednesday, you can try to talk to this employee A or to employee C, who is a good friend of B, in a very indirect way, trying to investigate whether they could be aware, trying to check whether this guy disclosed. If you find that he has disclosed, Again, you want to see what you are in the mass, you go to the general assembly. So you, you keep on monitoring this information. Don't let it just be released in a, in a hazard manner. The other thing is eh, you must not use confidential information for selfish gains. Eh? Now that you know some information about your employer, don't blackmail. Don't threaten them. You know, for example, you may come across the documents of your employer and realize that he does not pay taxes. And according to your computation, this guy should have paid taxes of 60 million, but he only pays 3 million. So there is a difference of 57 million that is not paid. And then you go to his office with the document. You know the consequences. And then the guy tells you, yes, I know that he what in the mask. Yes, what going? Yes. Uh, come over there. Oh, it's someone who is passing. Okay. Uh, so I'm saying once you have discovered that there is a uh, attack issue. You go to your boss. Mapia Sasa, he can the Then you leave the office. After a week, you go back. Mapia, he can yarai wa likuwa meni pigi asimu. He kama naona kama wana says at the end of that. Sasa nataka ushara yangu yongeze tabu. Yo ni chali mukuti na wa. For sure, ata ongeza ushara the first month. Then second man will be hey, at our Jama Waki are hey, when you now come out of Shika, Taka Utamu my son. It will go that way, and by that man, this guy will tell you, What are you doing? Are you good? Sit up for Gaza, but by the time you are good, I'll have failed to tell you. So now that is very wrong to use confidential information, more so the weakness of a person. For your advantage, it is very, very wrong. It's a medical, it's a god. I can add that one. It's a god. Yeah. It's just like what we see even in offices. Simply because someone is looking for a promotion, or someone is looking for a job, yeah? or someone is looking for an advance, you want to take advantage. You tell them for me to do this and this, then you must comply with this. It's a medical. It is very bad uh, because we are taking advantage of the situation. The other thing is about integrity, number three. Now, integrity is simply good manners. It is good behaviors. And integrity has become very, very important, even in government. But if you look at our 2010 constitution, you will realize that a whole chapter six has been dedicated to matters integrity. Because integrity is very, very important. My integrity as a person should bother you as my student. I don't know whether you know that. Uh, 
Do you think my personal life has anything to do with you now that I'm your teacher? What do you think? It has nothing to do with you. Alice, you're It has nothing to do with me. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Whether I have chased my wife, whether I'm yes. a pastor, whether I'm a Murevi, whether I'm a Mwizi, whether I'm a good person, it has nothing to do with your life, still. Yeah. <laughs> From today, I'm going to you know it has a lot to do with your life. Mm -hmm. okay. How? How is this? As your teacher, I command moral authority over you. Is that so? Yeah. And there are some things I will pass to you, whether you like it or not. Now that I'm going to teach you, yeah. you will somehow start reasoning like a man You will somehow start arguing like I argue. And that's why. I'm sure you may want to to work in this work. One will fuse one and none. Have you ever heard of that statement? Yes. It is because my values, somehow I pass them to you. It's only that maybe at this college level, I've been a fool only for two months, so I may not have a lot of time to influence you. But where I can teach you, like for three semesters, I will influence you in very many things. Such that mtu agadi pate mwenye ananijua akipatana na wewe asikie venye unaongea. They can easily tell wewe kwani ni wewe umefuzwa na kimani. Because I am able to influence you. When a leader starts there and they speak they influence society. We copy them. They are our role models. Actually, there are some people I have taught. And when they become teachers, I hear them speak like me. Do you come is here, but come out. Even in churches, unaskia mtu anaongea kama pastor wa. So it is very, very important. My personal life, you should be concerned. Am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Because the same behavior that I believe in, even the kind of examples, and as we go by and by, be keen on the kind of examples I give you. They will be able to point to you my value systems, what I believe in, what is my standing in society, and what I keep on feeding to you eventually will determine your life. So if I believe in uh, taking a lot of alcohol, I will give, be giving you a lot of good examples of how you need to take alcohol or how I have, I have had some good moments with alcohol and so on. If I believe in mango, the Akanisa, I will be giving you examples, Nakanisa, those kind of things. So they are very important. If I'm a thief, if I'm a fraudster, I'm a auditor who cooks books, I will keep on showing you how you can cook books. I will give you examples of how I cook books somewhere, how I succeeded. Those kind of things, and eventually we will also start cooking books somehow. So integrity is very, very important. And now, narrowing down to our notes, we are told we must mitigate any conflict of interest, any actual and any conflict of interest that can come in. You see, like in this case, uh, a conflict of interest comes in where more than one person are interested in one person. Like in this case, I'm going, there is Destiny here. Destiny Technical Training Institute. And there is the man here. Then we have one boy here. Now, Destiny is interested in you as their student. The man is also interested in you as his student. And the interest is money. Now, where did you pay your money? To destiny. You paid to destiny. Who is teaching you? 
the money. Do you think money requires this money? Yes. So <laughs> it would have been possible, Nikwabi, especially like now that you are alone eh, for this class, eh, I would have yes. told you what a kulipa shule, nilipe kato, nita kufunza. Na badala ya kulipa the 10,000 you pay to the school, nimi nita kujaji 5,000. Would that be a good deal? Would have been. Eh? It could have been. It could have been, see there? Yes. Yeah. It could have been, could have been a good deal. And unfortunately, <laughs> You've been a tight corner because if you refuse to accept my deal, I mean, when I come to this class, I can decide to frustrate you. Is that so? Yeah. Yes. And the school will not know. I mean, please, but I'm doing all this because. Now, this thing is very unethical. It's very unethical. If you have a conflict of interest, so what I should do as an employee of Destiny, if I seriously need this money from Wakoli, I should move out of Destiny. Wabia Sasa, me, me, I'm no longer part of destiny. I am now here. So you can decide whether to come to me here or you go to destiny. But not, I am still in destiny and I'm using that to get money directly to me. It is unethical. And the reason is, there are people who come to destiny not because of Kimani. Actually, uh, maybe I need to confirm that. Whoever recommended Destiny to you, did they mention my name to you? Yeah. No. So that means you are not in Destiny because of Kimani. You are in Destiny because of Destiny. Is there? Yes. So if Kimani moves out, Destiny is not in Destiny. But if Kimani moves out, Destiny is not in Destiny. Then you are here not because of Destiny. You are here because of Kimani. And if Kimani moves out of Destiny, then utanifuata kwenye itaenda. So we must be able to know which customer is here because of destiny and which customer is here because of Kimani. So that when I step aside, only those who are in destiny because of me will follow me. And those who are in destiny for destiny, they will be. That is the way it is supposed to be done. If you are working as an auditor and you have been sent to go and audit a client, I hear of these stories very many times. You have been sent, uh, the client is paying 200,000. But where we shall I have, maybe in that house. So you can go and talk to this client. You want to be a sasa, but I have to pay 200,000. You mean that I will be 50,000. And that's why you can't. Now, either way, you will be able to pay me, you will be able to now this guy can make can see some sense and pay you 50. When they, he pays you 50, he will have saved 150. And for you, you will have gotten an additional 20. It may look a good deal, but it is unethical. It is very wrong. What you should do is resign from that company. Go start yours. Then approach this customer as a new company. If they give you the job, well. If they remain with the former uh, uh, company, well and good. That's how it's supposed to be done. That's about mitigating. And uh, also, you must not do something that can easily be misconstrued. Something that can easily be uh, judged that you are likely to fraud. The other thing is, uh, you must refrain from any conduct that would prejudice uh, carrying duties or discredit the profession. You see, for example, uh, there are some people who believe taking alcohol is not bad. We are not one of them. But we have some people who believe it's not bad, and they take. Now, if they take, they, it is not good that they come to the class drunk. 
When it is time for class, when it is time to work, they should be sober. After work, they can go take their alcohol. We have no problem as far as the profession is concerned. Profession is concerned. But if you take your alcohol and you come to the workplace drunk, smelling of alcohol all over, it is again a medical. It's a medical. Something like issues to do with love, the love affairs. We know we are human beings and we have emotions and we express them in terms of love or even in terms of hatred. And we have cases where even teachers and students develop love relationships. Now, one, it is unethical. At the workplace, it is not recommended. And if it happens, because we cannot rule it 100% out, if it happens, it is advisable you practice it in a way that it is not so open. You are not showing everyone that now who you my best mate, who you my workmate is my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my husband or my wife. When it comes to work, it is work issues. Mambo ya mabezi, ama hata mambo ya wadui, those ones you deal with them outside the company. So you must not do things that can discredit the profession. That when people look at you and say, ah, how are you doing this job? Ah, accountant, you miss this job, accountant. It is unethical. You must maintain integrity. The last one is called credibility. Now, credibility number four, it has to do with uh, objectivity. And when we talk about objectivity, we are talking of three things. One. When you are communicating, communicate to everyone in a fair way, in an objective way. If you are communicating to four people, use the same medium of communication. It should not be person A, you make a direct call to them. Person B, you send an SMS. Person C, you send an email. Person D, you personally take yourself to them. This is wrong. Because these mediums, they generate different rates of reactions. They have different speeds. They have different significance levels. So there are some people who will get the message when it is too late. There are people who will not get the, 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 uh, the gist of the message, the substance of the message. Some people will be denied that opportunity. So when you're communicating, be fair. Kama ni SMS, kila mtu SMS. Kama ni kujipeleka personally kwa watu, jipeleke kwa kila mtu. Kama ni kupiga simu, pigia kila mtu. That is the way it should be. Number two, when we talk about credibility, is that uh, you should disclose all the relevant information. When you're talking to people, don't hide some information. Unfortunately, people and even businesses, they will never tell you all the information. They give you a bit of information. You think that you have gotten it. After you get it, they tell you no. Una kitu ingine uko wogezi. Una kitu ingine uko wogezi. A very good case in point is about these loans that we get from the bank. I remember taking a, a facility from the bank. What? Have you ever taken a facility, a own facility from the bank? Are you aware of how it's done? Yes. Uh huh. Say, for example, you have applied for a hundred thousand. How much are you given? Or are you given the one hundred? Hello, Namatika. No, you're not given a hundred. Good, you are given less, Sidio. Yes. And that deduction, it is never mentioned at the point of applying the rule. This document is all the ukijaza, where unajaza, ukitarajia, na unajaza mia. It is only when you are almost there, or when the rule has been approved, and you have submitted, uh, after submitting all the relevant documents, na piwa sasa, insurance, So you find to a medidac like seven or three thousand. So you are given ninety-two thousand or ninety-seven. Now this is 
At times, it's very disturbing because they never disclose to you. And it is unethical. So if you are communicating with a person, it is good you tell them the true status. And I think this is one of the things I try to, to, to bring to your attention when you are engaging about this class. I painted to you how things are. So that as you make a decision, you don't pay your info, you pay your money, and then come to realize, oh, he kitu, oh, he konamuna hii, namuna hii, kama ni katajwa, no. You should disclose as much as possible. Let the client make the decision. Don't try to, to con people. Don't try to attract. And then after you think you are a cage, you won't take advantage. It may not work. Or it may work in the short run for your good, but in the long run, it will be very, very negative for you. The other thing is uh, when it comes to credibility, is that you should disclose the delays and the deficiencies. Now, the delays happen, uh, you see, like yesterday. I told you the class will uh, begin at what time? It's that. It's that. But I don't know whether you check the message that I sent, the login details. You call me Anika 835. Now, this one was a delay. I should have informed you a little bit earlier that German is a bit of an answer, but it's a chalewa to do on a five. So that between 830 and 835, we see the case of 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 You should disclose as much as possible. Not all the times, because not every time you'll be able to communicate. it. But what we are calling for is you take the earliest opportunity to inform the person that there will be a delay. The other thing is that you also disclose a deficiency. Deficiency is where what you will communicate is not what the person is expecting. For example, when you do an exam with CASP and you're waiting for the results, now to say the results will be released on 20th of uh, October. And by date five, CASP are already doing the marking your exam. And they know you have not done so well. So they should not wait until 20th to give you the shock. Somewhere around maybe 12 or 15, they should send you a message to Akwabie, we are working on so well, and we target to release the results by 20th. However, they may not be as by your expectations. So you are not told exactly how they are, but at least you are alerted that they may not be as by your expectations. So that gives you an opportunity to start doing what we call scenario analysis. Nimeanguka ama simeanguka. Nimeanguka moja ama bili ama tatu. Ama nimeanguka nitafanya nini. So you start preparing yourself. So that finally when the results come and you find you have not done well, it will not be a big shock. It will not be a crisis. So that is what should be done as far as credibility is concerned. So we have those four ethical standards. Are we okay at that point? Yeah, we are good. Good. Let's now introduce a bit of decision making. Uh, decision making, I don't have much to say because much of it will be discussed as we have the questions. Uh, and uh, maybe for the first area that we have discussed, in your own time, look at the past papers, you will find some questions that have been tested from what you have discussed. Uh, decision making, first of all, when we talk of a decision, we are talking of selection of an option from a set of options. And maybe at this point I ask you, did you know of any other school other than Yes. Do you think you could have afforded their school fees? Yes, it's only that they didn't have uh, online classes. Okay. Now the issue of the online classes, that one now was to, to make it. Yeah? Because okay. Not, okay. I want us to take the, the factors that apply to uh, 
to off. So you knew of more than one schools. Uh, you could have afforded their school fees. Okay. You could be able to access them. Is it there? Yeah. Yeah. Now, all those who are available to you. So you made a choice. Which happened to be destiny, and we are very grateful for choosing us. Now, this choice was made so that you can achieve a particular objective, which earlier on you had told me that you are looking for getting what? Knowledge and specifically passing your exam. So, a decision is simply a choice of one option from a set of options with the objective or with the, with, 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 with the intention of achieving a particular goal. Now, this selection process is guided by two factors. One is what we call personal preference. Personal preference is what you prefer as an individual. It is what makes us to say that the beauty is on the eye of the beholder. That's why you will find people making different choices regarding the same situation. The other thing is what we call risk appetite. Now, risk, first of all, is the probability that the actual will be different from the expected. And fortunately or unfortunately in life, for you to experience the actual, you must have committed yourself. See, like now I'm going, for me to teach you, you must have paid your money. Is that true? Yeah. Now you paid your whole 10,000 to a person you have never seen, <laughs> to a school you have never been to, because I don't think you have physically come to a place. No. But you paid your 10,000. After paying, you now sat and hoped that that's how I was going to do That is what we call the okay. Now you are in my class. I'm teaching you. That is what now we call action. Your mind is doing a very quick comparison of what you are expecting and what now you are seeing. And there are three possibilities. What you are seeing is exactly what you expected. You expected a good teacher, now you are seeing a good teacher. Or you expected a bad teacher, and for sure you are seeing a bad teacher now. So they are The second possibility is where the actual is bigger than the expected. You expected a very poor teacher, but now you are seeing a good teacher. You are actually congratulating yourself that you have come to this class. You expected... Hello? No. You expected that maybe our online class is that But now here we are. I see. So the actual is more than the expected. Now, if the actual is more than the expected, it generates an emotion that we call satisfaction. And that satisfaction creates happiness and is the one that makes us to say thank you. Although people really say thank you. The third is where the actual is less than the expected. You expected a very good teacher. Now you are finding a very bad teacher. You expected very clear online projections and very clear internet. Now you are finding something different. Now, if the actual is below the expected, it creates an emotion called dissatisfaction. And it is the one that makes people to start complaining. People become bitter. This is the most expressed. Actually, even today, chances are who may fikiria complain for whatever reason. But chances are maybe you just say asante. Or whatever is it. And people have served you. What you want to say that you are going to happen by? In the process, most likely you have not said thank you, but maybe you have complained. Or if you have done both, complaints could be more. 
Now, this company is bitter. Because you paid your 10,000. If we are not teaching you, what do you do now? I'm going to come out to the pussy. You're going to say, I'm going to take that. I could have done something else. Yeah. Eh? I could have done something else. Yeah. No, Sahina, you will leave a person. I have just to go up here. We are not teaching. How many answers do you have to do? The final answer. I would have been bitter. You will be bitter. You will be bitter because you are going to be a pride for the vibe. You are going to be a pride for the vibe. You are going to be a There will be a lot of bitterness. And those are the answers. Now, that is what you call. Risk. And fortunately, in life, you must take risk. So, when the unexpected happens, how do you handle that? Do you become totally discouraged? Or say, the me, me, sit away in a college fee, me, me, sit away in some CPA, me, me, sit away in a he. I'm a little bit of a query, how are you? If you have a young, let me go for another college. How are you? If you have a young, let me do another one. If you have a young, let me try something else. Okay, you know, how do you react to that? That's what we call risk appetite. Now, in that case, we have three types of decision makers. We have number one, they are called risk neutral. These are guys who do not consider risk. Number two, we have the risk takers. These are guys who take a lot of risk and they end up getting a lot of returns quite often. Number three, we have risk averse. These are people who fear. They don't take risks and eventually they don't make a lot of returns. So we have those three types of decision makers. So because of the personal preference and the risk appetite, we make choices. Now, risk is measured using two parameters. We have the standard deviation and we have the coefficient of variation. The formulas are given as you can see there. We will be using them as we have those questions. Uh, the steps to follow, I don't want to discuss those steps, but in your own time before the next lesson, I suggest you take a look at them uh, so that as we have the questions, we'll be going through them even the conventions and so on. Uh, Decision-making environment, it is about where you make decisions, where you are. We make different decisions depending on where we are. And uh, we have four types of environments. The first one is called the environment of competition. That's about game theory. Uh, that's more now in QA, it's not here so much, so we'll not get into details. The environment of certainty is where you are very sure. Like now here, uh, here and now, we are sure that this lesson must come to an end. We may not know exactly what time it will end, but we are sure the lesson must end. The environment of uncertainty it is where we are not very sure of the possible outcome, exactly which one will come out to be true. And we have rules that we use. Uh, they are listed there. We will be handling questions for each one of them. We have the environment of risk. Now that's where we have probabilities. We will also be handling questions on that. And finally, we have the value of information. Value of information is the one that determines how much you will pay. Now, how much you pay? Right now, it was guided by the value you think you will get. Yeah. If you think that you are going to get more out of this class than 10,000, then you pay 10,000, which is the case now. But if you think you will get something less, then you cannot pay 10,000. That which you can pay is the value of information and we will also be discussing to or we will compute it. So those are the notes, uh, and that is the discussion about that first area. So in our next lesson, we will now have the questions in that. I have sent you the past papers, so make sure they are ready. You can even print. Uh, make sure in the next lesson, you have a calculator. So come with a scientific calculator in the lesson so that we start computations. Is that okay, we're going? Okay. Hello? Yeah, it's okay. Good. And meanwhile, the doctor will have to do it again. Nice time, eh? So we meet on Thursday now, eh? Okay. Thank you.